Hood. In the Hood. In the Hood. Hood. I'm the Black, Black Baby. Baby. KJ, KJ, welcome, welcome you to another, another edition. edition. Turn the Hood edition. The House 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 Stuffing me, I like to keep it light and easy. I'm your man KJ Green. Welcome you back to another edition of Sports from the Hoodwood. And let's right off the top get to one of the biggest stories of the week, if not the year. Ohio State, Michigan. Stuff Snuffy says it best. A clash of the Titans. Number two OSU. Number three Michigan. Going head up for the Big Ten East title and a chance to go to the Big Ten Championship in Indianapolis next week to more or less beat around Iowa and ascend to the college football playoff. Is this an eliminator game? Like last year when these two teams, then ranked two and three, faced off in Columbus, Michigan pulling the win and and more or less laying a path to the college football playoff, even though they did lose in the semifinal to Texas Christian, but they got to the playoff more or less laid out a path as Big Ten champs. Ohio State, using that as their only loss of the season, had enough chops and cred to be able to take the number four slot, where they would face Georgia, losing in a dramatic game on New Year's Eve. That being said, are we seeing this scenario happen again? Unlike last year, when you had a bunch of teams kind of fall out of the uh, the picture, and you had a lot of one-loss teams hanging around, trying to get the scraps left. Everybody knew Georgia was the number one team, unbeaten. They were not. They were unquestioned going to the CFP. Two, three, and four were still a question. This year, the field's a little bit more crisper, a little less murky. You have Florida State. You have Washington. You have those teams waiting in the wings. Ohio State and Michigan may very well be an eliminator game. The late John Saunders used to say the regular season was the playoff. I hardly disagree with it, but I still say games like this still mean a lot. The Ohio State-Michigan winner in Ann Arbor will undoubtedly have an inside path to the college football playoff. It's easy to point out that the team that wins this game will remain undefeated and will have legitimate creds and chops to be able to ascend to the college football playoff, provided that they win their uh, Big Ten Championship game against Iowa, which I won't say is a foregone conclusion, but Iowa's allergic to offense. And if a team can score 17 points, (laughs) they're going to be pretty good to go against Iowa. I still think that whoever wins this game on Saturday will ascend to the college football playoff as the Big Ten champ. 
Now, the loser of this team will have to go pretty much sit in purgatory and wait. Will the Pac-12 championship shake things out? Will the ACC championship shake things out? Will there be a one-loss Texas team still waiting in the wings, hoping to get their shot? I still don't think the Big 12 champ will have a, have a legitimate path to the college football playoff, especially if you have Washington and Florida State go undefeated. Now, Florida State's pass a little bit harder with their quarterback, Jordan Travis, suffering a lower leg injury and out for the rest of the season. Florida State was punished by the CFP, pushing them down to five. So now they're on the outside looking in. But you have these two teams, again, in the Big Ten, State having dominated the series in the 20th, 21st century, but Michigan has won the last two. And as I said before, both teams, like last year, are ranked two and three in the college football playoff. There are more teams ready to step into the breach, as I've stated. And it just seems like the picture's a little bit more clear this year, or I should say more focused, with more teams ready to step in. There's a lot less murkiness. Now, if there's losses that come up this week and next week, with a lot of rivalry games going on this week, and championship games going on next week, Things could get a lot more more uh, grimier or murkier. It's going to be pretty pretty uh, more defined when we get together next week to look at the CFP. But things still have a way of getting crazy, and you never know what's going to happen. Next year, this won't even be a crisis because you'll have 12 teams, as the Hoodwood has long advocated that there should be. Now you're going to be worried about placement and who gets the first round buys and who gets home games. It's going to be a lot more easier to pick out 12 teams than to eliminate just down to four because you're going to have a one deserving team that's going to get left out. But with the playoff expanding to 12 teams next year, it's going to be a lot more easier to pick out. But for now, you still got the chaos. Just stay tuned. I could almost hear the screams of Bengals fans in my neighborhood. Joe Burrow walking out with wincing, looking like he was hurt. His right wrist grimacing with every throw, then walking off the field at M&T Bank Stadium toward the tunnel. Bengals fans' playoff hopes going a-glimmering as their franchise quarterback was then diagnosed with a uh, wrist injury and marked out for the rest of the season. The Bengals are 5-5 five and five in last place in the AFC North, though they are still quite much in the AFC playoff race. They still hold key wins and could still ascend to the playoffs, or can they? Looking at the Bengals' schedule, it is absolutely brutal. They still have their nemesis, the Steelers, to play twice. Coming up this Sunday in Cincinnati, one of the first of two games. And a Saturday game right before Christmas. They still have a Monday night game in Jacksonville. They still have to play the Chiefs. They still host the Browns. They have a fairly tough road game in Indianapolis. They have the Vikings still to visit in the middle of December. As I like to say, good luck. You're going to need it. The team and, and, and collectively has struggled without their, their uh, franchise quarterback. The Bengals have only been 2-5 and five in games since 2020 that Burrow hasn't started. And they are not averaging a lot of points. Their offense has been more or less neutralized. Add in the factor that Teams are going to be doubling up on Jamar Chase because T. Higgins will be missing his third game in a row. The Bengals defense, long regarded as a team that would feast it on takeaways and stops under Lou Amaruno, who is probably going to get a head coaching job of his own, has struggled. Players like DJ Turner and Dax Hill, they've shown glimmers and glimpses of, of, of fine play. Cats like Trey Hendrickson making great stops. But the problem is, is that the Cincinnati defense plays way too inconsistent. 
and playing inconsistent in a rugged division like the AFC North ain't going to get you nowhere. That and a coke and a smile might get you a little bit further. But with teams like the Ravens, who have already swept the Bengals, the Browns already holding a, a, a win against them after the Bengals' sorry week one performance in Cleveland. The Steelers looking like they can maybe want to pit and pull the knockout punch, though they have problems of their own offensively. They're not a juggernaut by any stretch of the imagination. The problem is with Bengals is they have relied way much on Joe Burrow so much. Jake Browning will take over as quarterback for the Bengals for the time being. He doesn't lack in confidence, but will he make the fear of the long ball like Joe Burrow did the way he was able to scramble, climb the pocket, get out of trouble, innately sense danger, and get away from it? Does Will he inspire confidence in his teammates the way Joe Burrow does? I'm liking it the way the Steelers did when they knocked out Carson Palmer in the 2005 wild card game. They didn't fear John Kitna. They feared Carson Palmer. When they knocked him out, they sat back and said, just wait, Kitna will screw up. He did, and the Bengals lost to the Steelers. The Steelers, long bullying the Bengals and long wanting to laugh at them, at their plight, are not so much the fearsome bully they've been of past seasons. We'll get into that in that game a little bit more in depth in the week 12, the rest of week 12 previews a little bit later on, foreshadowing. But for now, looking at the Bengals, are they in trouble? Bet your bottom dollar they are. At 5-5, five and five, I'm looking at the la their last six games, seven games, and wondering, are they going to win any of these going forward? These games that are on the docket are some of the toughest, if not the toughest, rest of the uh, schedule that any team has. Look at the playoff teams that are on this docket. Look at the teams that are contending for the playoffs. Look at that schedule and find me wins. Maybe you may have to wait till 24 for the Bengals to come back and be a contender. And with Joe Burrow looking more and more injury prone, it's a serious wondering question. Let's take time out. Come back and look at Shohei Otani. What teams will he court in free agency? He doesn't want teams to talk about him being courted, else he might shoo them away. And what teams are suddenly on, uh, looking, maybe looking for coaches because theirs are on the hot seat? Sportsman Hoodwood comes back at you after this. Is today your last day on Earth because you are being deployed to space tomorrow? Have you just turned 18 and you're ready to get out of your parents' house? Has your granddaughter gotten her boyfriend pregnant? Whatever your reason, you need us at GottaGetMarriedNow.com. We specialize in last-minute weddings. Active duty, military veterans and retired discounts are available. Visit us at GottaGetMarriedNow.com. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's premier destination for no-nonsense commentary, thorough analysis, and logical insight on the world of sports. Now here's the man that Wikipedia and Google call for sports fact checks, your host, K.J. Green. You are back in the Hoodwood. My name's K.J. Green, and Snuffy says some seats are getting warm. I have heated seats in my truck, which I like. But seats in the NFL coaching ranks are never good if they're hot. There are a handful of coaches this year that are looking over their shoulders and wondering, is the axe going to fall? Notably, in Washington, where Ron Rivera has been the coach since 2020, and he fired his defensive coordinator, Jack Del Rio, after the commander's abysmal performance in Jerry World on Thanksgiving. Getting hammered to the score of 45 to 10 is not going to make you too many friends in defensive coordinator circles, especially not with your head coach. 
Ron Rivera is looking over his shoulder badly after Dan Snyder was unceremoniously dumped as commander's owner, being forced to sell the team for a pretty penny. I mean, he wondered if the new owner is going to want to bring in his own staff. Rivera's a veteran coach, and he's been around for a while, coaching the Panthers and then coaching Washington since 2020. But his team right now is 25-33-1, and, and they're going nowhere in the NFC East. Commanders probably won't make the playoffs, and that might spell the end for Rivera. Also, another play, uh, coach that may be in trouble is Mike Vrabel of the Tennessee Titans. The Titans are horrid this year. They're 3-7, and seven, going nowhere. They're having trouble at quarterback, and Derrick Henry can only do so much. Vrabel has been with the Titans since 2018, and his record, even though it's fairly decent at 51-38, and 38, the Titans haven't made the playoffs since 2021. They've won two AFC Titans out. AFC South titles, but have gone nowhere in the playoffs. You remember they famously got upset by the Bengals in the 2021 playoffs when they had the number one seed. The team hasn't done that much ever since, famously getting blasted by the Jaguars last year in a do-or-die showdown for the division title. Even though they started out 7-2, and two, they lost five straight games to tumble out of, the, out of the ranks of first place and still had a shot at winning the division, but lost. Titans haven't done that much uh, this year, and Vrabel's seat has gotten very hot. He may very well lose his job. A, te a team that has played in the playoffs last year, but their coach is still under fire, is Brandon Staley of the Chargers. This team has been playing mediocre, and in the AFC West, where the Chiefs more or less rule, the Chargers have not played well. They face the Ravens this week, and if they lose, that team will fall to 4-7, and seven, and more than likely, out of the playoff hunt. Brandon Staley took a ton of fire, 10 tons of fire, after his team blew a huge lead to the Jags in the wild card round last year, before lo eventually losing. Brandon Staley has had way too many opportunities to make this Chargers team good, and he has a great team. Justin Herbert is a fantastic young quarterback, and they have great receivers in Keenan Allen. But their defense has played inconsistent. And Brandon Staley has been questioned on some of his questionable game time management. If his team falls out of the playoff race, the Chargers may very well be going hunting for another coach. And finally, a coach that some people say is on the hot seat, but I think it's something of not really of his own making, is Robert Sala of the New York Jets. Now, Aaron Rodgers getting hurt the first quarter of the first game was not Salah's fault. Having Zach Wilson, who can't play, can't quarterback his way out of a paper bag, is not his fault. Wilson should have been, at best, a backup. So now he's gone through three quarterbacks. His team is four and six, and they're not doing anything. As of this taping, they're playing the Miami Dolphins, and they're probably going to lose that game at home. Many people think Salah and his other New York counterpart, Brian Dable, might both lose their jobs. The Jets had a promising season, torpedoed by Aaron Rodgers' injury. The Giants, the Giants are just the Giants. We're not going to get into them, even though they upset the Commanders last week. They're going to get. They're probably going to win again against New England, but we'll talk about that in the Week uh, 12 pick coming up later. But these are teams that may go looking for head coaches. Possibly in the college ranks, possibly in the coordinator ranks. Who knows? But their seats are getting mighty toasty, and it's not because they have seat warmers to drive the truck around. Now, it's no real big secret or surprise that Shohei Otani of, of the Los Angeles Angels is going to get paid. And when I mean paid, I mean stupid paid. Snuffy says it best when he says $500 million will pay by a lot of bones, by a lot of anything. There are a number of teams that are waiting with checkbooks ready to write out a stupid amount for the combination slugger and big name pitcher. Now, Otani has had Tommy John surgery. 
on his pitching elbow. So he's gonna not gonna be able to pitch at least for a year. But he still can hit. Tommy John surgery doesn't affect his ability to swing a bat, and he can still hit with power. So a half of a combo player is better than no combo player at all. There are a number of teams that are wait waiting to bid for his services. And what teams are in the top running of his services, not in any kind of particular order, I have anyway, Chicago Cubs. Why? Because Chicago's a big market team. They would love to cater to uh, Shohei Otani and show him a big uh, city field that he always likes. That's a team that's in desperate need of a superstar and needs to ascend from its 2016 hangover of a, a, a World Series. They haven't been back anywhere close to the postseason since winning it all seven years ago. Another team that may be in the running for Otani's services are the San Francisco Giants. Now, two teams, San Francisco Giants and the Seattle Mariners, both have a large uh, Asian following. And both teams would love to have an Asian, a you know, Japanese-born superstar in their ranks, especially the Mariners. You saw how big the Mariners were when they had the legendary Ichiro patrolling right field for them. To have a two-way player on that squad would be a bonanza. Both in San Francisco and, and Seattle would both encumber large uh, Asian-American followings if they were able to land the Japanese superstar. A couple teams in the wild card that you may think of are the Boston Red Sox and the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers. Boston Red Sox love throwing money at big name superstars. And with that inviting uh, right field porch and the Fenway's Green Monster as inviting targets for a slugger like Otani, might be hard for him to resist. Pitching may be a bit of a problem because Boston's pitching staff is pretty shaky. Now, the Texas Rangers, if you add a superstar like Otani to their ranks, that's almost criminal. That team is deep with hitters and deep with pitching. They could bring Otani along slowly, not having to rush him back for his pitching services, but be able to plug his bat in as an as a everyday DH. Of course, you're going to have to factor in the New York teams, the Yankees, the Mets. They're both going to be saying, come to New York, make yourself a star. It's not like Otani isn't already a star, and New York teams have this uh, mentality and complex that if you want to be a star, you have to play in New York. A lot of teams and a lot of players are sitting back going, rolling their eyes, going, why is it always got to be New York? If Otani ends up with the Yankees, Lord help us. Now, the Yankees weren't that good last year. Aaron Boone, his hot seat, we were talking about hot seats with NFL coaches, none are hotter in MLB than being in, in the Bronx. Steinbrenners are never patient. Brian Cashman is not patient. Aaron Boone may need the big splash of a star like Otani to take the pressure off of him. And Otani and Aaron Judge hitting together? Mercy. The New York Mets, I mean Mets, they like to throw money at, at big name players too. Steve Cohen is not shy about throwing money at players. And somebody like Otani, he would throw big dollars at him to get into playing Flushing Queens. And then you have the two obvious choices, the Los Angeles teams, the Dodgers and the Angels. The Dodgers, they're not shy about throwing money at players anyway. And to add Otani to an already loaded lineup, a team that won over 100 games again and is a big, as a big a name as you can see with talented players like Mookie Betts, Clayton Kershaw, and the like on their squad, to add Otani to that loaded lineup would be damn near criminal and maybe could get them over the hump in the uh, MLB playoffs. And of course, last but certainly not least, he could go back to the team he's been with and has, has known his entire Major League career, the Los Angeles Angels. That's home. That's where he's got it started with. He also has his buddy Mike Trout backing him up. But the Angels have not done anything in the, po in the regular season, much less the postseason, since Otani's gotten there. What team will Otani choose? And he has basically told any team, if you publicize that I'm talking to you, you're getting pushed to the back of the line. So it's going to be anybody's guess, people speculate like me, where Otani's going to go. I personally think he's going to the Los Angeles Dodgers. They're a winning team. They can throw money at him. And they, they have playoff potential. They've dominated the NL West for a dozen years. And if they get Otani, they will be the, the top choice to win the World Series in 2024. It's anybody's guess.
all about justice in the Hoodwood. So it's Snuffy. And he wants justice for Jacksonville State and James Madison. And you go, who? Who are these teams? Probably the two best Division I teams that you probably are not paying attention to. And probably two of the teams that are probably two of the quietly best, I say better teams in D1. Now, both of them have ascended from the FCS ranks and have made the leap in a spectacular fashion. Think of Appalachian State when they uh, jump ranks into the Sun Belt Conference after getting some notoriety after beating Michigan in 2007 at the Big House. James Madison is 10 and 1. That's not a misprint, folks. They are 10 and 1, and they just lost their first game. They had ESPN Game Day in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and before a packed house. And they lost in overtime to Appalachian State. Hmm, when have we heard that that tent, that name before? But it's not like James Madison has been playing okie dokes and cookies. They went to Charlottesville and beat Virginia. In Virginia, beat them by a point. They've beaten teams like UConn. Well, anybody can beat UConn. I can fall my sleep if I'm in bed and at two in the morning beat UConn. But that's neither here nor there. The Dukes are ten and one. And they can't go to, they can't even go to the Sun Belt Championship game, where I'm pretty sure they would wax Troy. They did it, they've already beaten them this year and beat them at Troy. Hmm. They have Coastal Carolina uh, Saturday afternoon in Conway, and that's going to be pretty much their bowl game because after this game, they can't go to a bowl game. Why is that? Why does the NCAA have to punish a team because they've made the jump from FCS to FBS? Now, I've heard the argument that they try to keep a team, you know, who's not ready to make the jump, make them wait a couple years for bowl eligibility, but why? I can understand keeping them, you know, from reaping all the profits, you know, from making the jump, you know, making a jump to a bigger conference, not getting all the TV money. I can understand that, kind of a probationary period. But why are you keeping a team from getting a bowl game and getting financial reward? Reward these kids for such a great season. Same thing's happening in Jacksonville State. Not Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville State is an actual, actually a school in Alabama. They're playing in Conference USA. And you might have heard their, of their coach, a guy by the name of Rich Rodriguez. He's still in this league? Yeah. Jacksonville is in at Jacksonville State is actually in Jacksonville, Alabama. And they're in the Sun Belt Conference. And they have went eight and three. They have won notable big games over teams like Eastern Michigan, uh, UTEP. And they're gonna be playing New Mexico State in Las Cruces this coming Saturday. And New Mexico State is going to the Conference USA title game against Liberty. Now, one of the Jacksonville State's three losses was at Liberty. They played against, so I beg your pardon, they played against Liberty in Jacksonville, Alabama. They lost 31 to 13. But Jacksonville State is in their first year of FBS. James Madison is their second. Why can't and, and, and there's somebody put up a proposal then it would be perfectly legal and the NCAA could do anything about it. If you play a game in Hawaii, that is considered an exempt game. It doesn't count against the 11 or 12 games that you play in a regular season. Play a game in two weeks in Hawaii. Jacksonville State against James Madison in Hawaii. NCAA can't do anything about it because it's in Hawaii. Hawaii could sponsor the game, Get a bit, get a cut of the profits, and everybody's happy. You get, you send these two teams, deserving kids, to play in an exotic place, and they're playing a worthy opponent. You don't have the uh, other bold teams whining that somebody took their spot because they're playing each other. Let them play one another and have a really good time. And I bet you'd be probably a better game than some of these bowl games. Why not? 
tell me a reason why these two deserving schools should not get a fair shake and a fair shot at a bowl. So we make it make sense. Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. I've been asking that plenty of times the NCAA. Do right by these two schools. Do right. For once in y'all damn life, do right by somebody. You're too busy catering to these big schools and you got these small schools, deserving schools that could use that national exposure. What are you afraid of? Answer me that question. Let's take time out. Come back with week 12 of the NFL docket. Let's see if we can keep this pretty decent streak of wins going with the picks. We'll take a look at them. Sportsman Hoodwood comes back at you after this. I'm actor Rajim A. Gross. Some of the studios would like to scan our images and only pay us for one day's worth of work and be able to use our likenesses, our voices, our mannerisms as computer generated characters, not only in the movie that we might be filming in, but in all future films as well. That's not fair. And I think the SAG board members that are fighting for my rights as an actor to work on a union film. So I just want to say standing in complete solidarity with everyone. Thank you. You are tuned in to Sports from the Hood Wood, the Internet's foremost location for opinion, analysis, and insight on the world of sports. Here now is the man banned from sports trivia contests in 38 states and four Canadian provinces, and not to mention Guam. Your host, KJ Green. You're back in the Hood Wood. My name is KJ Green, and has the trip fun worn off for you yet? Me, myself, ate a little bit of turkey before going to bed and slept like a baby. Many people are still getting over their post-Thanksgiving haze. I didn't imbibe as much because I've been hard at work getting these picks cooked up for you. I went 2-1 and one on Thanksgiving. No thanks to you, Lions. And the numbers are not being counted on the tote board behind me. And as usual, the odds are being provided by ESPN for comparison and entertainment purposes only. The picks here for your review, approval, and perusal. If you bet the Lions and lose your shopping money, that's on you. I have no extra money to spare you. Now, let's get started with the games of Sunday, November 26th. This is a CBS doubleheader weekend. And as I noted often, check the good folks at 506sports.com for an excellent coverage map. First game on the docket is the 6-4 Steelers taking on the 5-5 Bengals at Pecor Stadium in Cincinnati. 1 o'clock kickoff on CBS. The Steelers are two-point favorites. Last week, the Steelers lost to the Browns 13-10, while the Bengals lost to the Ravens. 34-20. Fast fact is the Bengals have won four of the last five meetings between the two clubs. The Steelers' offensive woes reached a nadir with a pathetic showing in Cleveland, and this cost and battle offensive coordinator Matt Canada his job. They head down state in Ohio to face the spiraling Bengals who have lost two games in four days and lost franchise quarterback Joe Burrow to a season-ending wrist injury in the process, as noted before. If Burrow was piloting the Bengals, I'd give them a better than a puncher's chance to extend their recent winning ways against a hated rival. But no Burrow equals no chance for the Bengals to pick his Pittsburgh. Next on the docket, we have the 7-3 Jaguars taking on the 6-4 Texans at NRG Stadium in Houston. 1 p.m. kickoff on CBS. The Jaguars are 1.5 point favorites. Last week, the Jaguars defeated the Titans 34-14, while the Texans defeated the Cardinals 21-16. Fast fact here is Texans rookie quarterback C.J. Stroud is only the second rookie to have three straight 300-yard passing games. The only other one, Joe Burrow of the Bengals. Now the Jags bounce back strong to whip the Titans and head into a massive showdown with the surprising Texans team who not could only move into first place with a win, but would hold a crucial tiebreaker with a season sweep. 
CJ Stroud is looking more and more like he is the real deal. And he's giving the Texans a real swagger they've lacked in years past. I like the Jags as a whole, but the Texans look like they're ready to make that next step and win here gets them moving forward a lot faster than a lot of people thought they would be at this time last year. The pick is Houston. Next on the docket, we have the 4-6 Buccaneers taking on the 5-5 five five Colts at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. 1 p.m. kickoff on CBS. The Colts are two and a half point favorites. Last week, the Buccaneers lost to the 49ers 27-14 while the Colts were on their bye. Fast fact here is that since winning their first two road games this season, the Bucs have lost three straight on the road. Now, speaking of a spiraling team, the Bucs are spiraling badly, but are, of course, still very much in contention in the Uber Week NFC South. They had to Hoosier Country to face a rested Colts team off their bye after a sluggish but winning effort in Frankfurt. I used to think that Baker Mayfield and Gardner Minshew were the same person. No, seriously, they could pass for Ken. Put the pictures next to one another and make a comparison of your own. And their play is equally as middling as best, which is reflective of their team's respective records. To be honest, this is a coin toss game at best. I don't trust either team, but I trust the Bucks less on the road. This pick is, like I said, a coin toss game. The pick here is Indianapolis. Next on the docket, we have the 5-5 five five Saints taking on the 4-6 Falcons at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. 1 o'clock kickoff on Fox. The Saints are two-point favorites. Last week, both teams were on their respective buys. Fast fact is that Falcons starter Desmond Ritter is 5-1 in his home starts. Believe it or not, this is a battle for first place in the NFC South. That's NFC South, there's enough said there. In any other division, it wouldn't, but both teams, teams just need to hang around 500 to be in contention. In any case, these teams are struggling with consistency at the quarterback position. And as much as, and this is the one that plays better in this matchup, will probably get the win. As much as I like to advocate for fellow Bearcat, Desmond Ritter, who has gotten reinstated as Falcons starting quarterback, his inconsistent play just bothers me. And I think that the more established Derek Carr can grind his team to an ugly but badly needed win. The pick here is New Orleans. Next on the docket, we have the 2-8 Patriots taking on the 3-8 Giants at MetLife Stadium, East Rutherford, New Jersey. 1 o'clock kickoff on Fox. The Patriots are 3.5 point favorites. Last week, the Patriots won their bye while the Giants defeated the Commanders 31-19. Fast fact, this will be Bill Belichick's 423rd game as Patriots head coach. That will be matching Don Shula's tenure as a Dolphins head coach. Only George Hallis with 506 and Tom Landry with 454 have been with one as one coach with one team longer. There once was a time that this was a marquee matchup. Two of the NFL's elite franchises over the last quarter centuries with 10 Super Bowl titles between them and two of the G-Men's chips at Pat's expense. But that was so long ago. Both teams have fallen on harder times. The Pat's slide has been kind of gradual as the talent that Bill Belichick was usually able to corral and garner has not been forthcoming as of late, and the G-Men's magical 2022 season looks more and more like a one-year aberration than a trend. Belichick is stuck with ineffective Mac Jones and Brian DeBall is using whatever bum of the month that he can come up with, with Tommy DeVito having his hand at the number one slot right now. In any case, what was once an anticipated matchup is only being seen in the Northeast and even fewer care. Pick here is the New York Giants. Next on the docket, we have the 1-9 Panthers taking on the 3-7 Titans at Nissan Stadium in Nashville. 1 o'clock kickoff on Fox. The Titans are 3.5 point favorites. Last week, the Panthers lost to the Cowboys 33-10, while the Titans lost to the Jaguars 34-14. Fast fact here, the Panthers are one of only three teams to have yet to notch a road win. But they're the only one that could get a road win this week as they face the other team that is winless on the road in the Tennessee Titans. And the other team, the Arizona Cardinals, are home this week. These two teams are going nowhere, and it's my bet that both one of, if not both coaches, might soon be unemployed. The Panthers are not making the progress that they had hoped with Bryce Young at the helm, and the Titans are going in circles. They can't depend on Derrick Henry every time, and their quarterback between Ryan Tannehill and Will Levis has done absolutely different. Since the Pan Panthers are not a team to win on the road, I'm giving the edge to the Titans. The pick here is Tennessee. Let's take a timeout and come back with the late and primetime games. 
and Sports with Little Bit rolls on after this. Again, here's the man of the hour, After Hours, your host, KJ Green. You are back in the liquid. My name is KJ Green, and let's continue on with the late picks of the NFL Week 12. First on the docket, we have the 4-6 and six Rams taking on the 2-9 and nine Cardinals at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona. 4-5 kickoff on Fox. The Rams are two-point favorites. Last week, the Rams lost to the Seahawks 17-16, while the Cardinals lost to the Texans 21 to 16. Fast fact here is the Rams have won eight straight meetings in Arizona dating back to 2014. Now this matchup is so worthless that the Cardinals are enforcing a blackout of the concurrent Chiefs Raiders game on CBS that will be playing opposite of this game in this same time slot. The Rams are looking more and more mediocre by the week and while the Cards play has markedly improved with the return of Kyler Murray is only landed of a single win since his return. Trusting either team is tricky at best, as you never know which team is going to show up. And I think it's high time that the Cards break this losing streak that the Rams have over them in their crib. And I'm going to mark this, the Hoodwood Upset of the Week, by picking Arizona. Next on the docket, we have the 6-3 Browns taking on the 5-5 Broncos at Empower Field at Mile High in Denver. 4-5 kickoff on Fox, the Broncos are one and a half point favorites. Last week, the Browns defeated the Steelers 13-10, while the Broncos defeated the Vikings 21-20. Fast fact here, the Browns are 7-3 for only the second time, that other time being 2020, since returning to the NFL in 1999. Now this matchup looked like a yawner when the networks were parsing out the game coverages a few weeks back. But you can bet that CBS wishes they had this matchup between these two teams that have pushed their way into the playoff picture. The Browns are 7-3 and three despite going through a litany of quarterbacks. And the Broncos are 5-5 five and five in spite of themselves. But for a rapidly improving defense, there's nothing like the mess that gave up 70 to Miami in September. Tough call to make here. But I'm going to kind of go slightly against the grain and pick Cleveland. Next on the docket, we have the 7-3 Chiefs taking on the 5-6 Raiders at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. 425 kickoff on CBS. The Chiefs are 8.5 point favorites. Last week, the Chiefs lost to the Eagles 21-17, while the Raiders lost to the Dolphins 20-13. Fast fact is the Chiefs have scored 0 points in the second half in each of their last 3 games. Now the Chiefs, still stewing after their home meltdown against the Eagles, head to Vegas to take uh, to face one of their favorite punching bags in the Raiders. Now, the Silver and Black have played better as of late, but only have a pair of wins over weak teams from Gotham to show for it. Now the Chiefs have won each of the last five meetings, 10 of the last 11, and 15 of the last 17 meetings, and are looking to get back right. 
even with all their current foibles and, and issues and problems, they are still light years ahead of the Raiders. That's why I'm making Kansas City the Hoodwood Lock of the Week. Next on the docket, we have the 6-5 Bills taking on the 9-1 Eagles at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. 425 kickoff on CBS. The Eagles are three-point favorites. Last week, the Bills defeated the Jets 32-6, while the Eagles defeated the Chiefs 21-17. The fast fact here is that Bills coach Sean McDermott has wins against 29 of the 31 NFL teams he has faced. The Eagles and the Cardinals are the lone exceptions. Now the Bills put it back suddenly all together in routing the Jets, but now the task gets a whole lot steeper as they head to Philly to face the surging Eagles squad brimming with confidence after rallying beat the Chiefs in Kansas City. I have no faith in Josh Allen putting together a solid game against a sneaky good Eagles defense, and while Jalen Hurts doesn't put up crazy numbers, he limits his mistakes and piles a steady if remarkable offense. The Eagles at home are a stone cold lock, but I can pick up with confidence. Pick here is Philadelphia. The Sunday night game is the 8 3 Ravens taking on the 4 6 Chargers at SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California. 8 20 kickoff on NBC. The Ravens are two and a half point favorites. Last week, the Ravens defeated the Bengals 34 20, while the Chargers lost to the Packers 24 20. Fast fact here is the Ravens have 44 sacks, which lead the NFL this season, and they have registered at least one sack in 32 consecutive games. Now, the Ravens may have very well climbed to the head of the AFC class, especially after knocking out a divisional rival that was thought to give them the most trouble. They now head to the City of Angels to face a wildly inconsistent Chargers squad that squandered numerous chances to knock off a very weak Packers squad. Lamar Jackson isn't putting up eye-popping numbers, to be sure, but his steady hand has kept the Ravens near the top of the division. And while this may delve into an entertaining shootout, I think the Ravens have established themselves as a legitimate contender. The pick here is Baltimore. Turning to the Monday night game, we have the 3-8 Bears taking on the 6-5 Vikings at U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis, 8-15 kickoff on both ABC and ESPN. The Vikings are three-point favorites. Last week, the Bears lost to the Lions 31-26, while the Vikings lost to the Broncos 21-20. Fast fact here is the Bears have lost 12 straight divisional games. Last week, the Bears looked like they were going to break that losing streak and had a stunning beatdown to the Lions in Detroit, but tragically blew a 26-14 fourth quarter lead to take the L. They head to the Great White North to face the Vikings, who are on their second primetime date in eight days. They themselves blew a late fourth quarter lead, on the road in a winnable game. Josh Dobbs is very much human, but I think he finds the Bears' suspect defense a lot more manageable than the week four, and I think at home that should be good enough. The pick here is Minnesota. And let's get a quick bonus Thursday pick in because both of these teams will have played on Thanksgiving. The 6-5 Seahawks taking on the 8-3 Cowboys at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. 8-15 kickoff on Prime Video. There has been no line provided as of this taping. Last week, which would have been Thursday, last of Thanksgiving, Seahawks lost to the 49ers 31-13, while the Cowboys defeated the Commanders 45-10. Fast fact here is the Cowboys have won 13 straight at home, but the Seahawks have won two of the last three meetings in Dallas and four of the last five overall. Both teams are coming off of Thanksgiving Day games of wildly different proportions. The Seahawks look re very much flat at home against the 49ers, while the Pokes look absolutely devastating in a home route of the Commanders. The Seahawks look lost in offense and defense and are catching this confident Pokes team at the very wrong time. Dak Prescott is needing to pr prove his bona fides against a winning team, and I think that he can get it here. The pick is Dallas. There you have it. Last week, I was 9-5 with the lock in Thursday game from last Thursday to 16th, correct. And the upset incorrect from 104-58 overall. 10-1 on the locks, 5-6 on the upsets. Let's take our final timeout, come back with the Hoodwood Hot 5, that dap, head slap, and the final word from the wood. Sports from the Hoodwood heads down the home stretch. Hi everyone, I'm KJ Green. If you're looking to reach a broad audience for your advertising dollar, look no further than where you are right now. You can advertise right here in the Hoodwood. If you need spots created as well, Black Banner Productions Enterprises can 
create commercial content that drives sales and gets results. And send your inquiries to ads at blackbannerproductions.com. Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises. Sounds, ideas, and images in the 21st century. And head slap and the final word from the wood. Let's look at the Hoodwood Hot Five, which is the top five teams based on the Hoodwood Power Index. I can't tell you what that is. If I did, I have to kill you and I like you too much. Just five teams that I think are the best in the country, not necessarily the CFP five. Let's just rank them from five to one. Starting at number five is the Florida State Seminoles, who are 11 and 0, 8 and 0 in the ACC. Last week they were fourth ranked. They defeated North Alabama 58-13 their senior day. Their next game is at Florida. They have clinched a berth in the ACC title game in Charlotte next week. The fourth-ranked team is the Washington Huskies, who are 11-0, 8-0 in the Pac-12. They were ranked last week number five. They defeated Oregon State 22-20. Their next game is the Apple Cup against Washington State. They have also clinched a Pac-12 title game berth in Las Vegas next week. The number three ranked team down from number one is the Michigan Wolverines, who are 11 0, 8 0 in the Big Ten. They defeated Maryland 31 24 for their 1000th program win. Their next game is against Ohio State. The Buckeyes are the second ranked team in our Hoodwood Power Index top five. They're also 8 0 in the Big Ten, 11 0 overall. They were ranked third last week and they defeated Minnesota 37 3. Their next game is, of course, at Michigan. The winner of this game clinches the Big Ten East and will play in the Big Ten title game in Indianapolis next week against Iowa. The number one team in the Hoodwood Hot Five is the Georgia Bulldogs, who are 11-0, 8-0 in the SEC. They were ranked second last week. They defeated Tennessee 38-10. Their next game is at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. They will stay in Atlanta for the next week's SEC title game berth against Alabama. And there you have it. That's my hot five. What's yours? And now let's take a look at the fat dap and head slap of the week. The fat dap, I guess it'd be kind of personal, goes to Aziz. I'm going to get this guy's last name right sooner or later. Bandeago. Okay. Now let's look at the Fat Dab Head Slap of the Week. The Fat Dab going, and I say it's a personal one, to Aziz Bandeago of the University of Cincinnati, who was finally awarded his, granted his transfer from Utah Valley for a uh, transfer hardship. Most of the time, NCAA will let you have a free transfer, but a second transfer, you have to apply for a waiver. He applied for the second waiver to transfer to the University of Cincinnati, and that transfer was finally granted. He was able the seven footer from Senegal had eight points and nine rebounds in his and a block in his first game in the Bearcats route of Georgia Tech on Wednesday, the 22nd. Now, from a personally selfish point of view, I'm hoping that the NCAA grants a, a subsequent transfer waiver as well to Jamil Reynolds, the transfer from Temple, so they can complete a very strong back line for the Bearcats. But that's just personal, but that's a fat dap to Benedago, and welcome to the Bearcats. It's good to see them having a true big man on the squad. Our head slap of the week goes to somebody who I'm just increasingly not really liking that much, Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports. He's the head poobah at that site. 
and he whined that he intends to sue the Cincinnati Bengals for the $100,000 that he lost betting on the Bengals-Ravens game because Joe Burrow was not known to be hurt as he initially let on, that he had a problem with his wrist and he aggravated that injury and, and subsequently was knocked out for the season. Nobody told you to bet that much money on a game there, Portnoy. Why you throw that kind of money around is beyond me. If you ain't got it, afford, can't afford to lose it, don't bet it. It's as simple as that. Without further ado, let's move on to the final word from the wood. I mean, seriously, Oakland seems like a nice enough town. It's more blue collar than its fellow Bay Area neighbor, San Francisco. A lot less bougie than its down bay neighbors in San Jose and Santa Clara. You know, at one time, Oakland was a home to all four pro major league teams. The Raiders started play in 1960 and played all over the Bay Area before finally settling into the Alameda County Coliseum in 1966, opposite their NFL brethren 49ers who were down at Candlestick Point. The A's moved to Oakland in 1968 from Kansas City, settling also across the bay from where the Giants had settled in 10 years previous. The Warriors came to the Bay Area in 1962, played all over San Francisco before moving to Oakland in 1971 from San Francisco and shared the Oakland Arena with the nascent California Golden Seals, an NHL expansion team that had started playing in 1967. The first team to leave the Bay Area was Golden Seals, who struggled with attendance for quite a while and moved out of the Bay Area in 1976. They eventually moved to Cleveland and eventually merged with the Minnesota North Stars, another failing NHL franchise. The remnants of this team is now in Dallas, as the Dallas Stars. Hockey returned to the Bay Area in 1991 with the Sharks in San Jose. Now, the Raiders left after the 1981 season as their Svengali owner, Al Davis, fought with Oakland officials incessantly, then abruptly moved the team to Los Angeles in 1982, where they played 12 years in the City of Angels before moving back to Oakland in 1995. Alameda County Coliseum was renovated to add more seats to the chagrin of the A's, who derisively called the additional seats Mount Davis, as it closed off the breathtaking view of the Oakland Hills in the background. Ironically, after these seats were built, the Raiders tarped them off, citing the now obsolete NFL blackout rules, which reduced the stadium capacity from 63,132 to 53,286, less the chances of game being blacked out in the Oakland area. The Raiders then moved again in 2020 to Las Vegas after that city built a billion dollar playpen, Allegiant Stadium. The Warriors played in the Oakland Arena as the Golden State Warriors, winning titles there in 1975. 2015, 2017, and 2018, and was long regarded as one of the louder arenas in the NBA, though it lacked some of the luxury amenities that the Dubs wanted. They eventually moved back across the Bay to the Chase Center in the San Francisco's Mission Bay neighborhood. That left the A's, who were the last long-standing team to call Oakland home. They survived the ownership of the Cheapskate Charlie family, though they won three World Series in Oakland, Kicking off a five-year golden age of Oakland sports, where the Warriors won titles in 1975 and the Raiders won the Super Bowl in 1976, bringing a total of five championships to the East Bay between 1972 and 1977. They then thrived over the, under the stewardship of the Haas family, where after the Bash brothers played the pack houses from the 1987 to 92 seasons, winning three AL pennants and a World Series in 1989. They revived under the Moneyball regime of the early 2000s, and as recently as 2020, made the playoffs. But now, this team is moving, following the Raiders to Vegas. Vegas. The MLB owners approved the move last week, and the team will take residence there in 2028. Seriously. The A's lease at the Coliseum runs through next year, but there is no suitable venue for the A's play in Vegas. The Raiders don't want them to play in Allegiant Stadium, and the Giants don't want them to play in their facility in San Francisco. The A's owner, John Fisher, seems to take a page from the fictional owner of the Cleveland Indians from the movie Major League, make the team bad enough to stay and keep fans away, and prompt a move. The 
A's lost 102 games last year, then increased ticket prices, and then doubled season ticket holder prices. Can you imagine being an A's season ticket holder right now? The result, the A's lost 112 games and drew only 832,000 fans in 2023, a year that Major League Baseball set attendance records. The A's were the only team in Major League Baseball to not draw 1 million fans, and all but five teams in the Major Leagues had double the Oakland A's attendance. In any case, Fisher cited this as a primary reason to move the A's out of Oakland, but you already know what the game plan is. He reaps a couple of years of, you know, takes a financial hit for a couple of years, then moves to Vegas, reaps big profits, and then, let me try that again. But you already know what the game plan is. Fisher holds on to the A's and takes a financial hit for now. Then when the team moves to Vegas, he reaps a couple years of big profits, then sells the team at a near record uh, profit. And meanwhile, the good people of Oakland, who supported the A's through many a lean year, kept the fires burning for the Raiders, gave the dubs an intimidating home, court advantage, are left orf orphaned in pro sports altogether. It leaves the question still to be answered. What did Oakland deserve? <laughs> Try it again. It leaves the question still begging to be answered. What did Oakland do to deserve this? And that is the final word from the wood. <music> Greetings from the Hoodwood, where I hope you didn't eat too much like Hoodwood Hound did. He ate too much stuff and complained about it still. Me, I kept it light. Kept it easy. Didn't want to eat too much. You know, this weekend, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm your man KJ Green welcoming you back to the Hoodwood and right off the top let's get to the biggest game of the year. Snuffy says it best. It's a clash of the Titans. Ohio State, Michigan ranked two and three respectively in the CFP poll for the Big Ten East and the trip to the Big Ten Championship game where they should be able to smack around Big Ten West uh, champ Iowa and ascend to the college football playoff. Is this an eliminator game? Now, I have no dog in this fight. I like just watching the game. But I grew up in my hood being a Michigan fan. And to the chagrin of my peers who lived around me, who lived and died by the scarlet and gray. I made me feel like I'm proud in this, this, in those parts. Not a word out of you, Snuffy. I'm not talking about cats. Anyway, I thought the Bucks were more back in the day. They had the grind it out offense. Earl Bruce on the sideline in his funeral fedora, looking like he was always bored. I like Michigan's wide open offense. Their colorful helmets, their fight song. Bo Schembeck was berating the officials at every turn. Now, I grew out of that fascination, especially when I found out how expensive it was to go to Michigan. Really expensive. And believe it or not, I actually applied to Ohio State to go there, and they turned me down, suggesting I should have be going to one of their satellites. Sports from the Hoodwood is a Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises presentation of a 551 Audio and Films production.